at this point, I had just finished basic combat training in the fall of 2006. I spent two weeks home on block leave, and then I left Michigan to fly out to Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio, Texas. So wake up would be like at 0430 or something obnoxious. And then we were expected to be on the drill floor by 05 in uh, army PT uniform. And, you know, you're doing push-ups in a sand hill, hoping that the fire ants don't get you. And sometimes they did. And you go to class. And you get like a 10-minute break to go to the bathroom once an hour or so. But they are dumping information into your head just as fast as they can. They taught you to think like a civilian EMT because that was how they got you to pass the test. And the first test you take is a CPR exam, right? It's basically they run you through CPR in a week because for a lot of us, that was our first exposure to it. And I didn't pass that test the first time, but then I passed it on the retake just barely. And then that set kind of a bad pattern for me where I would fail the first test and then pass the retake. Right. And you can only continuously do that for so long, or at least only I could. It was all the fun and stress and drill sergeants of basic combat training with an extra added bonus of a crash course in modern emergency medicine. So you got to be on the ball. Right. Because they made one thing inherently clear. If you failed, people died. And so after each day in class, we'd march back right and gosh we'd have a break for lunch and we marched down to this place and i want to say it was called slagle defac and then probably had lunch chow for around 11 30 to 1300 and it sounds like a long time but we had companies that were like 500 people big and so you get that many people and it's not like you can just run them through real fast not normally you know, it's going to take a minute. So then after 1300, we'd be back in class, right? Class was till 1630, right? Looking at it now, it doesn't seem, it was normal nine to five army work day. But at the time, I'd only been a soldier for like a few months. And so it was, it was all so very new and strange and different. And then after that, you'd have Chow at 1700. And then the drill sergeants would talk to us and then, you know, they'd have stories and then they'd tell us things they did during the war. And one of them described a patient in a combat zone as a live action training aid, which is kind of grim, but because his story, the way he described it was that I'll never forget this has burned my head. He said he was on a road mission with a junior medic. So someone had got blown up and he knew the person who got blown up was going to die. But he thought, oh, this is great training for my junior medic. So we're just going to sit here and work on this person, right? Maybe that was his way of telling the story with some sort of bravado or t detachment. Because if you can be emotionally detached from people you're working on, if you don't see them as human, but as machines to be fixed, it protects you kind of emotionally, mentally. If the worst happens and you fail and people die. So then around 2100 hours, we'd be let go. We'd be cut loose for barracks maintenance to call your parents to do whatever. But that was also the time dedicated for studying. And I realized that a little too late, I think. If I'm being honest. And so by the time the third test rolled around, when I'm really nose to the grindstone, I'm so far behind, you know, it doesn't make much of a difference anymore. By that point, I was only really getting like three hours of sleep a night. And by the time the fourth test came around, I, uh, I failed. I failed twice. 
by that point, I was so burnt out and out of gas. I was just going through the motions. I wanted to. It wasn't within my capability at the time. And then after that, I was a holdover. And a holdover is when you have soldiers in a training unit that are no longer in a training status. So I was just waiting and trying to fill the time. A lot of the times we'd hang out in this day room and they just kind of park us there and tell us to watch TV all day, which and it wasn't a great feeling, right, having failed. But it was a great teacher. It was the greatest motivator for me. I, right, I couldn't live it down. I couldn't, I had hit the point where I just, I couldn't fail anymore, right? Like I couldn't, for myself, I couldn't fail anymore. I had failed so many things in my life up to that point. The idea of failing again, I just, it just stuck with me. And then there was this fire. And then eventually I was sent away, but I took that fire with me. And I remember leaving the airport and thinking, I'll be back. <laughs> I don't know how, and I don't know when or why, but I will be back and I will finish this. But until then, I had to go to unit supply school in Fort Lee, Virginia. It was March of 2007. I had a few days before I was supposed to report, so I found myself a nice hotel for the weekend. And when I say nice, I mean the door locked. <laughs> you know, I, was, I wasn't really affording that nice of a hotel at age 20. And making early mistakes that weekend, I went out in my uniform. Because I was so fresh and so new in the military, I didn't know not only how against regulations that was, but how much of a cultural faux pas it really was. And there was a staff sergeant who stopped me in the middle of the street and educated me on where I'd gone wrong. But he was really nice about it because I had gone out and I'd played pool and I'd smoked cigarettes and had dinner in uniform. And I remember I'm walking around town. This guy runs out of a bar looks at me and says, hey man, what unit are you with? And I say, I'm not with any unit. I'm going to AIT at Fort Lee to be a supply clerk. And he goes, oh, I'm Staff Sergeant, what's his name? And you probably don't know this, but don't ever in your off time go out and about in your uniform. Not only is it against regulations, but it is very unseemly. And I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. And you know, I stood at parade rest and said, thank you, Staff Sergeant, and then I left. I went back to my hotel, and then I reported to Unit Supply Corps that Monday morning after. And it wasn't what I expected at first, because I only had two previous experiences with drill sergeants, with army training schools and all that, and it was... Medic school was structured in a very similar fashion to basic combat training, in that there were drill sergeants, and they threatened to kill you, and there was lots of screaming and push-ups and harassment. And if you even thought about stepping out of line, they would find you. And I get to supply school and going from having 110 roommates to three, that was pretty nice. I like that. And things just kind of, generally speaking, seemed a little bit looser in terms of the strict rigidity that I had known from the army up to that point. In retrospect, it kind of makes sense because... If you look at what that course was designed to do, 
It was designed to make people that were good at keeping track of the unit's property book. Medic school needed to be a place where you could insert people into an infantry platoon and then function solo during a mass casualty event. And in supply school, you just needed them to be good paperwork people, right? And there was discipline involved too in being a soldier, but the, the need wasn't as dire. You know, you're going over like how to fill out documents and, and hand receipts and how to hand receipt pe things to people. It's a chain of custody for items using the proper levels of documentation is what they're teaching you basically, right? But there's different versions of that. It's all very dry. And, but you know, that's the world functions on dry, boring positions. At least it very much did in 2007. And it was almost relaxing. I got to go off post for the first time on a regular basis. On the weekends, right, we'd get like 12 hour passes. And on those 12 hour passes, we had to have the drill sergeants ins inspect our barracks rooms first. And it took a while for them to get through the females first and then get to us. And so, you know, we cleaned our barracks room and then I'm asleep on my duffel bag. And I'm laying on the floor using it as a pillow. And then I opened my eyes and then there's a drill sergeant there standing in front of me. And I said, oh no. <laughs> and so I stayed up and hopped to parade rest. And I hit my head on the wire rack bunks we slept on. And I gashed the top of my head really well. There's just, you know, blood going down it. And the drill sergeant laughs at me. And he goes, well, I guess I won't need to punish you, Private. You done it to yourself. <laughs> I hope we've learned our lesson today. And then me and my buddy Andy, we go out to this little cafe on post. And I remember I'm kind of like a little dizzy, a little out of it. And he goes, are you okay? And I'm like, I might have a slight concussion. And he goes, should we go to a hospital? I'm like, bro, I... We got a 12 hour pass. I am not wasting this at a, at a, at a you know, going to the aid station. <laughs> and, I mean, I was fine. You know, I probably lost an IQ point, but you know, what are you going to do? And there were a lot of people there that were medic school dropouts like me. So many of the people at the time who washed out of medic school, some of them became cooks. Some of them became parachute riggers. A lot of us became supply clerks. And there was probably like a half dozen, maybe a dozen of us that had failed out of medic school at various stages. And it was this weird shared experience, that failure. And we all kind of had a piece of like, oh, we knew just enough medical knowledge just to like think we, you know, we knew enough big words to think we were smart, but we really didn't know anything, <laughs> but we wanted to, right? Because supply school wasn't where we wanted to be. It wasn't what we signed up to do. It was where we ended up, right? And that was okay. I know for me, I wasn't ready to be a medic yet. And I was so hungry. I just needed a win. Any win would do. And so I decided this is where I'll win. It'll be a simple win. It won't change the world, but it'll change mine. Because in my life up to that point, I had felt very unsuccessful. And the army was where I was going to turn all of that around. And part one of that, the first step of that, was graduating basic combat training. And then when I got to medic school, I got off track. So many of my old habits were still deep inside me. They were ingrained. And in medic school, you only needed a C- minus to pass a test. And so I thought, oh, I'm just going to shoot for a C minus because in high school I was shooting for a D minus. So in my idiot trailer park brain, I thought, oh, if I shoot for a C minus, I'm actually doing better. And technically, yes, I had raised my standards, but not enough because if you shoot for just barely passing, if one thing goes wrong, you fail. And I did. And I was in danger of my entire life going off the rails. Because so much was riding on me being successful in the army. I didn't have anything else. 
I had no other prospects, no other options. This was it. I had a friend there named uh, Stephanie who was one of the medical school dropouts. And we actually met each other in Foxtrot Company 232 Medical Battalion. And she and I felt very kindred spirit in a lot of ways because we we're on a very similar path. We weren't very successful in the civilian world and basic training was the one time that we had actually succeeded at anything in our lives. And then we failed out of medical school and that creeping realization that failure is only a couple of bad mistakes away drove us to, to ensure that we were successful in supply school. And lucky enough for me, all I really had to do was just show up and do what I was told and don't make too many problems for people. And surprisingly enough, that is a lesson that I had needed to learn. You don't gotta be great. You just have to not fail. And that's something that supply school taught me. It taught me how to not fail. And it got me to Big Army, as we had been calling it. And so I would go to Fort Gordon, Georgia at my first duty station and learn how the Army in the support section really functioned as a supply clerk. And that is all for me today. I want to thank you for listening. Check back in next Monday morning at 0700. And you better be on time, or you'll be late to formation. Mm -hmm.